Welcome uh, everyone to our CG webinar and this webinar is coming to you from the CG conference. CG conference was delayed in uh, on the 1st of April but is now taking place. We're going to run a succession of webinars, five webinars, with the conference papers that we plan to include originally in April, um, which have had the opportunity for upgrading and improvement since then uh, and they're now being brought to you in June, July. Today's session is our two doctoral students associated with the CG research program, Tom Brotherhood and Lily Yang. And it's a delight to introduce them because they're both outstanding people, but also people that I've had the good fortune to, uh, to, um, uh, to supervise, along with Alice Wanchar at Oxford. Um, so I think what we're going to do today is, is have two discrete paper sessions each of about half an hour. First, Tom will uh, speak, speak to his paper and then take Q&A from the participant audience. And then we'll have Lily and she will do Q&A as well. When we reach the end of the one hour, we'll turn off the video and the audio, but you'll be able to stay online and participate in the chat part of the webinar, um, which will continue for another 30 minutes or so. So if you don't get a chance to ask your question during the, the main paper sessions, the two half hour segments, then you, you maybe will be able to do so with the presenters uh, talking back to you on, um, in the chat at the end of the one hour. So without further delay, I should go straight to the standard web protocols, share the screen to bring those up. Please note that the uh, Zoom webinar today will be rec recorded and the chat ses session will also be uh, put on public display on our website along with the audio and video. Please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do turn on your video as well as your audio when you're asking a question. We recommend using the speaker view so that you can more clearly see who is talking. You can ask questions during the webinar or at the end of the presentations. Uh, and it's a good idea to put those questions in writing in the chat section so that I can see them there and I can pick you out and ask you, the quest ask you to ask your question. You can also use the raise hand button that's found in the participants section. When invited to ask your question, please unmute yourself, most important, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. So at this point, I'm delighted to pass over to Tom Brotherhood and to um, thank you all for coming in. We now have 90 people, it's good to see. And it's over to Tom. Tom will speak for about 10 minutes or so and then he'll move to questions and answer. Thank you, Simon. Um, thank you for that introduction. And I'll also, before starting, thank uh, Trevor as well for all of the help in setting up this, um, setting up this webinar. He's the comms manager at CG and does a terrific job. And thank you as well to the 90 people who've come on today to join the discussion. I'm really grateful to have you with, here with us. So today I'm going to introduce um, a few of the findings from my doctoral study, which is ostensibly a study of student migration in higher education that's deliberately placing uh, an emphasis on migrant agency and temporality. Today I'm going to discuss a few of the findings of the study and some of the implications as I see them. But first, I'm going to briefly introduce why I think student migration is such a, a worthy topic of study. So why would we study student migration? Well, first, I think a, a clear reason is the quantitative significance of student mobility and migration. Um, the OECD estimates that around 5 million students were mobile for their higher education as of 2016. And we now know that the international student population is growing faster than any other group of migrants. So there's clearly a quantitative reason that this is a significant subject to study, but there's also 
the reason that uh, international student migration and mobility is increasingly intersecting with other areas of policy. And Bass uh, recently argued that the two, international education and migration, are now entangled to the point that from a policy perspective, they may have merged. And one reason for this is that the advantages of retaining international graduates post-study is increasingly persuasive to policymakers. They have a great deal of linguistic and cultural skills they build during their studies that make them attractive um, as a migrant population. And they're also young and highly skilled, which means that their contributions to the economy take place over a long period of time, both during their studies and post-study. And there's also a very strong uh, soft power element to this as well. But despite the, the significance, um, our understanding of international student migration, both in the level of policy and in research, is beset by contradiction and confusion. I'm going to give a few examples here of headlines that have come out just over the last couple of years about this issue from a number of contexts. Now, context exists uh, contradiction sorry, exists between a number of different policy arenas, um, particularly education and the economy on the one hand that might be receptive to international student migration versus migration control on the other that may be more restrictive. And there is also confusion over the most effective ways to define and understand students as a migrant population and how that affects the way in which we might uh, manage migration flows. So what kind of research do we actually need? Well, I think research to date has focused on mapping student mobility flows and trying to identify some of the systemic drivers of these flows of students. And these studies have typically used macro level data and economic analyses with an emphasis on informing policymaking. And I think this research has been very valuable and our understanding of the significance of student mobility has stemmed from these types of research. However, I would also argue that micro level research that seeks to understand the internal dynamics of student migration has not kept pace with this. Most importantly, Bakewell um, out of Oxford has recently argued that the research to date has tended to skirt around the problem of structure and agency within the student migration processes. Critics began to call for a fuller investigation into agency in the early 2000s. But even as recently as 2018, Tran and Vu argued that um, there's been a neglect of agency within the context of student mobility, and it has not been explicitly the focus of theoretical and empirical investigation. So quickly returning to the question, what kind of research do we need? If we're to better understand agency within student migration, we need research that is, um, can harness the complexities of individual identities, is more temporally sensitive in situating student migration within a broader life course journey, and can capture the dynamic interaction of individual agency and structural forces throughout a student migration trajectory, which as we know, plays out over a number of months and possibly years. So this study briefly to introduce you to my research design, um, I chose to carry this out in two national case studies. Uh, on the one hand, the UK and in the other, Japan. And the reason for this is that in 2016, at the outset of this research, the UK was characterized by majority opposition to immigration. Reducing net migration had been on the legislative agenda for around six years at this point. And the, having lost the post-study work visa, there had also been the introduction of harsher eligibility requirements for both um, study visas and post-study work other transitions. On the other hand, Japan was in a period of opening up towards migrant communities. There had been the introduction of a few um, sort of beneficial routes to permanent residency for graduates of Japanese universities and more students were being enticed with incentives to study and the uh, easy provision and the sorry, provision of easily attainable uh, post-study path, uh, pathways to work. So at the outset of this research, the British and Japanese governments were illustrating con contrasting approaches to student migration, which I think identified them as uh, potentially fruitful contrasting case studies for this research. For the research itself, I draw on narrative data collected with 26 to be mobile student migrants, and I decided to interview each participant twice with an entry interview taking place during their studies and a second interview taking place after their graduation. Uh, and finally, I think any study of this nature requires a theoretical framework that can um, identify agency and its interactions with time. And Emma Byer and Mish offer such a model, which they call the caudal triad. And this is so useful as it delineates agency's temporal nature by distinguishing between three distinct but overlapping elements of agency that are oriented towards the past, present, and future, respectively. The real advantage of this is it draws attention to how actors can call on their past experiences, the contingencies of their present that they're currently undergoing, and their imagined futures when interacting with their context and constructing their life course and making choices about what they're doing next. So moving on to the findings, first I'll briefly talk about the influence of regulations on students' post-study options. 
And the, um, the findings of the study revealed that regulatory frameworks have a tangible impact on uh, participants, either in restricting or enabling their post-study options. This was clear in the contrast between the UK and Japanese cases. A number of participants in the UK made enormous efforts to remain in the UK and engage with as many different um, sources of information, uh, sources of information and support that they could, and were still unable to negotiate a transition that allowed them to stay in the UK. On the other hand, a number of participants in Japan found this process of staying in Japan very simple to the extent that it was almost incidental and it happened somewhat by accident to a lot of these participants. However, I would argue that the influence of the regulation goes beyond just their receptivity. Um, I think that there was a great deal of evidence uh, that participants had a variable understanding of these regulations and some of them were unable to comprehend the options that were available to them and those that were not, leading them to sometimes follow a large way down a dead end, something that would, they were not actually eligible to pursue, or to overlook certain trajectories that may have helped them, uh, but they were absolutely unaware of. So I think that this indicates that the stability and transparency of frameworks also plays an important role. If a framework is particularly opaque or unstable and changeable during their studies, I think this makes the identification of up-to-date information that may actually help them more challenging for students. And the provision of that on behalf of support mechanisms within universities is also becomes more difficult. The issue with having an unstable or opaque regulatory framework on top of the issues of receptivity means that students are subject to more uncertainty and often have to take on greater risk in negotiating their post-study options. Now moving on to agency specifically, I argue that the role of agency is dynamic within the education migration nexus and it changed throughout their trajectories in light of the evolving relationship between individuals and their contexts, but also the simultaneous evolution of the individual's life course project and how their goals evolved over time as well. In Emma Byron and Mish's terms, I found the, the iteration element of agency was the most pervasive among all the narratives and it seemed to be helping students to identify and recognize the default options, the, courses of action that had been pursued by perhaps their peers or were encouraged by important others in their family or perhaps role models within the universities. And this helped them to recognize their position within society and within the host country and what options were available to them. However, as we've discussed, these contexts were changeable and uncertain. And I found that the projective and pr practical evaluative elements of agency were important in helping participants to navigate these, uh, these changeable circumstances, particularly when they encountered barriers. Projective element of agency is quite creative and help people to imagine new pathways that they would help, might help them to navigate the barriers that they were facing. Whereas the practical evaluative element on the other hand was associated with a more critical sensibility that allowed them to get a deeper understanding of the barriers that they were facing and perhaps um, gave them more opportunities to consider what might be the best option that served their broader goals in spite of the barriers they were facing. Now, uh, Emma Barry-Mish also suggests that practical evaluation is an inherent, inherently transformative part of agency and that by understanding the conflicts people face, people also gain the capacity to engage with, resist and potentially subvert these barriers. Um, and I did find evidence of that in this study. What I also found, and this is a potentially novel development on Emma Barry-Mish's framework, is that uh, the iterational element of agency too provided some evidence of uh, providing participants with the ability to subvert the um, relations they found themselves in and the barriers they encountered. The reason for this was that I identified anti-iterational sentiment where students could recognize and understood what were the, de the default trajectories of action they could take and the post-study pathways that most were taking in their situation. But they showed a desire to deliberately do something other than that and in doing so, they were potentially disrupting a lot of the social relations around them. The practical significance of these results is, I believe, as follows. I think it reveals that individuals develop different agentic orientations throughout their trajectories in response to changing conditions. And the ability to use different types of agency in response to their changing conditions uh, had a big impact on their ability to navigate the post-study transition in a way that was beneficial to them and suited their goals and what they'd come to study in the first place. So Tran et al released a fantastic paper last year in which they discussed the uh, micro tactics that students in Australia employ when they're navigating their post-study transition. And I think that this would build on Tran and colleagues' 
findings, and I argue that student migrants may increase their opportunities in the post-study environment by actively seeking or being introduced to by support mechanisms within universities, different forms of agency that might give them access to a broader uh, swathe of tactics that can help them navigate their post-study options. So very quickly, just to close, here are some brief implications for research practice and policy. On the research end, I think that the, the discovery of the changeable nature of the assistance agency, if we hope to understand this in more detail in future research, the use of time series data, data that, it, that is sensitive to changes temporally is very important. Um, in terms of practice, I think that also has an, um, an important effect that if we want to support students in their post-study endeavors, then it's important that we interact with them consistently throughout their trajectory. We can't just speak to them when they arrive in the university and then when they're about to leave, which is the case for a lot of support mechanisms that um, my participants spoke about. I think it's important to be more consistent and also recognize the importance of when do we time interventions and the types and of information that we give to them to help better support them. And finally, in the level of policy, I would echo the recommendations of the recent UN compact on safe, orderly and regular migration. And what they, they argue is that in addition to the provision of information, it's very important that the information people are given at the start of their migration journey is representative of what they will, uh, what they will experience throughout the entire migration journey. As I mentioned before, student migration plays out over months or years. So I think it's important that when people are applying for university, the policies that they see there and the, the trajectories that they make available to them should be guaranteed throughout their studies. Uh, whether this takes the form of grandfather clauses or there's some kind of temporal guarantee to uh, the policies, whether it's three, five year plans or something like that, I think they can all make a great difference in ensuring that people don't have to take too much risk on in their post-study trajectories as international students. So I'll end it there and open up the discussion. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much, Tom. Um, I'm going to ask the first question, if I may. You spent um, a long time doing field work in both countries, both Japan and the UK, uh, and your, your core inquiries into student migrancy as agency. Um, did you notice any significant differences between the way those different modes, modes of agency played out in Japan as distinct from the UK? Uh, that's a, a really good question. I think that one of the major differences I saw, and this may be an artifact of the communicative uh, styles of people who uh, are being educated in Japan or educated in the UK, is that there was a, a greater degree of sort of criticism of this, of the society and the societal factors that were holding them back and the regulatory factors within the UK. Um, that may be that the criticism of government is something that comes more easily to participants in the UK, and maybe that is something that's inculcated in students at British universities. On the other hand, students in Japan were less likely to have that critical element of agency coming from practical evaluation and drew more on iteration and seeing different pathways that were available to them. Now that's partly, again, maybe to do with communicative styles, but I think that may also be an artifact of the fact that the environment in Japan was relatively receptive and the students encountered fewer barriers in trying to stay in Japan and particularly in the level of uh, visa applications that those things kind of went through quite quickly so maybe the students were less led to be critical of that system. So the barriers were different in each case or somewhat different can you expand a little on the on the barriers in Japan and the barriers in the UK? Uh, certainly. So uh, the biggest problem in Japan was the job hunting system is, is very difficult for uh, international graduates. The, the job hunting system is an annual process for the most part, in that if you're unable to find a job going through the, the annual job hunting system, then that you're forced to then take on a second year in the country, perhaps working in part-time or um, part-time part -time work, often in convenience stores and things like that. It's quite common. And you're essentially waiting for the next uh, round of recruitment in the, the large companies in that country. Um, that was a difficult process for a lot of students, but what there is the provision of in Japan is, the, is a kind of bridging visa. There's a, a type of visa that's there that can help people essentially engage in a year of job hunting. And it doesn't place restrictions on their economic activities, so they're able to support themselves in that process. So even if as a graduate, you're unable to balance your final year of studies and finding a job, which some of my participants weren't, 
and that was a that was a challenge they were able to then stay on this bridging visa and give themselves the opportunity to stay more long term now in the uk the system was rather different in that not only were there the same similar challenges in finding a job although the annual recruitment system isn't the, isn't the same problem here um, they a lot of people found that employers who are the route to finding a visa in the UK without an employer there is no such bridging visa that can help you through unless you're a doctoral student. Um, employers were not only unwilling to employ international students in a lot of cases because of the price of the provision of a student of uh, working visas for international graduates for example but they were also unaware of the visa regulations themselves as well so people would find themselves recruited for a job and then when it came to the nitty gritty of sorting out the um, sponsorship process for their visas, the employers would suddenly throw up their hands and be confused and say they didn't want to sponsor this person anymore, or would admit within, their, um, within the interview process that they didn't know what it was, and they didn't know if they would be able to sponsor someone, leading the students that I was talking to to be like, well, if I'm going to have to take on that level of uncertainty, I don't want to commit to this employer. So they're quite different issues that were faced in the two different countries. It's very interesting. Thanks, Tom. I'm going to bring in uh, uh, Mokidil uh, Mamasleva, who has a question for you. Mokidil uh, Mamasleva's question is, um, Tom, uh, could you please let us know if you have seen differences in the process of political identity development of your interviewees? Um, that's, a, that's a very good, a good question. I think, broadly speaking, I saw very little development of um, strong political identities among my participants. I would say that most people I spoke to, that wasn't something that they, that wasn't something that was a prominent feature in the narratives that I heard. Although in the cases of a few, it was very, very strong. So I felt there was two participants I can think in the UK off the top of my head who were actively engaged politically and were, would, would be going to marches and would be protesting against the hostile environment, for example. Um, and they were people who, broadly speaking, were very critical of the, the UK system, explicitly of particular policies and of particular politicians. Um, but that isn't something I found so much in Japan, but there is again one participant I, uh, I can recall who was very critical of broadly the treatment of migrants in Japanese society as opposed to at the level of policy. And so they were engaged in again a lot of migrant community groups that were, were protesting against the treatment of society rather than policy. So it wasn't, didn't approach a political statement or political stance on their, their behalf, um, but they were certainly engaged, um, socially engaged to a large degree. Yeah. I think you're muted, Simon. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, during the time in which you did your research and, and were writing up your data, did the situation change substantially in one or both countries? And how did that affect your study? Um, another good question. This is um, quite a tricky thing. So the situation in the UK changed quite a lot in terms of there were new restrictions put into place throughout the time I was actually interviewing people. But then there was always a constant undercurrent of campaigning on behalf of a number of uh, you know, think tanks and a number of people, the researchers in the UK, and in fact a number of usually ex-ministers uh, of um, education in the UK who are advocating for the reintroduction of a post-study work visa and we now have a tentative announcement of that and this has all been kind of used, thrown up in the air by COVID-19 of course but the, the, the campaigns to reopen to international students are there and it's a strong campaign um, and a lot of I would say that participants were aware of that and kind of saw themselves as you know an example of the people who had been who had been restricted heavily by the removal of the post-study work visa. Uh, and the changes in the context of that, that shows how it's not just the individual students and their desires that are changing over time, it's also the policy environment that can have a large effect. Now in the Japanese case, it was actually the fact that the visas were being even more open in the time this was going on. And what I found is that the, the highly skilled uh, workers visa in, in Japan that was introduced 
for the first time, I think in around 2014, initially it was very hard to apply for and that there was no English language version. The, the, the requirements that you have, the things you had to submit to actually apply for the visa were very difficult. But then in, during the middle of the study, that was actually made easier. There was an English version was released, the requirements were reduced, and actually the points-based system on which it's based, they started to give more points for people who graduated from Japanese universities, and particularly from uh, graduate courses. And that was actually something that my participants drew upon. And in the first interview, they hadn't been aware of, but in between, in the intervening time, that was something that was introduced that they then pursued and were successful in pursuing. So it shows how, how quickly the opportunities available to students, to international students can change. In that case, for the better, but it could also be for the worse. Thanks, Tom. I've got a question from Shin Chu at Oxford. Hello, Shin. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks, Tom. Excellent presentation. I just have a quick question about like how do you view the role of students agency um, under the current potential influence of the COVID-19 pandemic on students' migration and mobility, particularly in the context of the UK and Japan? Thank you. Was that, um, I didn't quite catch that, was that the influence on student agency of COVID-19? Yeah, I, I was thinking how do you perceive the role of students agency in terms of coping with the influence? Because you've talked about policy changes and the you know the broader context, but how do students use their agency to like uh, cope with the situation? Um, I think that's a terrific question, and I, I would uh, that was something I would love to pursue empirically. I think going forward, uh, it's a difficult one. Um, from an from an abstract sense, I would say that the, the restrictions on uh, international travel are likely to have an enormous effect on student mobility, and we've already seen that in a number of contexts. But at the same time, we have seen students kind of finding their way through the, the margins and finding themselves continuing to be mobile despite this problem. I mean, we've seen evidence from Australia of the enormous lengths that some students have taken not to have to return to their home countries or the, the quick the, the speed with which they traveled to Australia to ensure that they were there um, when the COVID outbreak was happening. I think that this changes the, the outlook of student mobility and migration greatly, but I would argue that despite the restrictions and probably the additional restrictions on, the, on uh, mobility we'll see for a long time, I would, I would certainly guard against suggesting that this is going to prevent uh, students from being able to exercise their agency in traveling abroad. If people who want to travel abroad will uh, go to extreme lengths to find ways to do so, and I don't see that being different in the in the um, context of higher education, even with even with the COVID crisis. Yeah, it's a very good question. Yes, it's a new ball game, really, isn't it? I mean, we don't. There's, we're very early days of understanding, you know, the crisis in terms of agency, and uh, we need new data, uh, and. Uh, number of organizations like us are making applications at the moment for research funding to support that kind of inquiry, but it needs to be done on a, on a comparative and cross country basis. I think I've got a message from uh, Mark Adil saying that, you know, will the uh, recorded session be available? And the answer is yes, it'll be on the website. Um, we make all of our zoom audio and video and the chat session available after the session. It usually takes, a day or two to get the audio and video up, but everything will be there. Tom, um, we've just about reached the end of our time with you, unless there's something burning that you'd like to say. Um, I, I thank you very, very much for your presentation, which was excellent, and the, your handling of the questions, which again, you know, added to our understanding of what you're doing. And we look forward to the completion of your doctorate and the publication of your book, we hope, and the articles arising from it all. So. Thanks you very, very much for participating today. At this point, I'd like to bring in our second presenter for today's webinar, that's Lily Yang, uh, who's working on the comparison between a Chinese or Chinese view of the role of universities in higher education and the Anglo-American view. Lily, I'll hand over to you and you've got uh, your presentation first. And then of course, 
we'll have questions and answer. Thank you very much, Simon, for your kind introduction. Um, I will try to share my slides here. Can you, can, can you, hear, can you now read the, my slides? Okay, okay, good. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from all over the world. Thank you, Simon, for your kind introduction. Um, and having me today, it's truly a privilege and a pleasure to share some of my research findings with um, such an international body of audiences. Perhaps bringing us all together in this kind of webinar format is one of the very few positive consequences of the pandemic. Now I want to draw your attention from Tom's brilliant interview-based talk to a more conceptually driven comparative study uh, of the public and public good of higher education in the Chinese and liberal Anglo-American traditions. Um, in the abstract, uh, which some of you might have read, I argue that the two traditions are with very distinctive political cultures, which have shaped the uh, very differing uh, pathways of higher education in relation to the public. For example, the relationship between the university and um, the government and the public expectation of higher education's public good contribution and so on and so forth. I want to start with one of the very um, primary differences between the two political cultures the understanding of the state. The Chinese state is and has always been a comprehensive state in contrast to the, the limited liberal state in the liberal Anglo-American tradition. The Chinese state is comprehensive in a sense that it has a comprehensive role that takes in all under heaven, including higher education, of course, and a comprehensive mandate for order, prosperity, and the collective good. Differently, the limited liberal state would argue for the protection of liberty and drawing a clear boundary of the responsibilities and functions of the state. Therefore, as we can see from the right hand of the figure that the state is often independent or separate from the market and civil society, an individual often has a um, supreme status. In this sense, um, the public is often understood in the public-private dualism. Um, in a sense that, for example, higher education is either a public good or a private good. They are mutually, uh, mutually exclusive. Differently, um, and I want to know that there is also another narrative about the public in the liberal Anglo-American tradition, which is influenced by the French Revolution, the civic Republican tradition about the communicative universal public, but I shall not expand it here. But if you are interested, we can have further discussion in the Q&A session. And now let's look at the Chinese tradition, the public and private in the Chinese tradition is a pair of relative terms referring to the larger selves and the smaller selves. And the smaller selves are often nested within the larger selves. And for example, individual within the family, the family within the state, the state within Tianxia or under heaven. And there can be many more entities sitting between either of the two circles, for example, local community between family and the state. As we can see from the figure that smaller selves are nested within the larger selves, we can uh, easily see that the public is often um, more primary than the private. The public takes precedence over the private. And if necessary, the public good can be uh, prioritized and the private good can be compromised for the sake of the public good. Of course, there are many nuances in both of the two traditions, and there have been some convergences into um, traditions in the modern era. For example, the growing independence of the individual in the Chinese tradition is no longer completely nested within the family. Um, but because of time limitation, I won't get too much into this. I want to spend the rest of the time trying to illustrate um, some differences and similarities by focusing on one pair of um, key terms, which is social equity or gongping in Chinese, which is an um, important or essential um, public good of higher education. This figure um, kind of illustrates some main findings of the comparison um, and also points out that potentiality for further hybridization of the two traditions. I want to start with the liberal Anglo-American tradition on the right, on the left hand. Um, based on a um, philosoph uh, philosophical exploration of um, ideas of some liber liberal thinkers, I argue that there are mainly three uh, philosophical rationales of social equity. 
The first is democracy, which is a fundamental um, rationale and distinguishes the liberal Anglo-American tradition from the Chinese tradition. It requires, it requires the elimination of um, discrimination, um, inequality in terms of political and civil rights and status. The second is social justice. According to John Rawls, um, there are two aspects here. The first is equal, uh, equal basic liberties, echoing um, political and civil equality. And the other is social and economic equality. I want to particularly highlight Amartya Sen's idea here, his idea of um, equality of freedom to achieve. He argues that social justice can only be attained when there is equality of freedom to achieve, when the, in other words, when the environment is providing um, desirable conditions for all individuals to develop their uh, substantial freedom, which is the capacity to make decisions and carry out their decisions. And this emphasis on external environment is important and I will come back to it later. Um, the third one is social order. Again, John Rawls argues that um, the social and economic equality can be important for the maintenance of social order. Now, the Chinese tradition, I argue that the main um, political, uh, political philosophical rationale is social order, which, has a, in, which incorporates another component of social justice, that social justice is important because it's good for the social order, maintenance of social order. Although the, the modern concept of the equity, social equity was introduced in China in 19th century, but um, the idea of social equity was already intrinsic to the Chinese culture, especially Confucianism. For example, Confucian himself would argue for social and economic equality. He argues that the key idea here is they worry that distribution of goods may be uneven. So there is an appeal for this uh, even distribution of goods. Also, there is another fundamental idea of moral equality that assumes that every individual is born with, as, with the same potentiality, equal potentiality to further self-cultivate themselves and reach the status of sage. Um, this, um, this success of the process of reaching the status of sage is mainly determined by individuals' personal motivation and characteristics, um, including diligence, perseverance, resilience, and so forth. And there is a somewhat neglect or ignorance of the influence of the external environment that um, the external environment influence on individual success is not that emphasized in the Chinese tradition, at least in Confucianism. So this points to a potentiality for our complementarity here, because the liberal Anglo-American tradition is emphasizing the external environment, and the Chinese tradition emphasizing internal agency or personality. And these two seemingly contrasting idea are actually complementary here, I argue. And here I want to borrow uh, Niels Bohr's idea, the principle of complementarity in one sentence. Contrary is not contradictory, but complementary. And this also echoes the Chinese yin yang philosophy here. Um, so this points out to that the two seemingly contrasting ideas might be complementary if we interpret them and try to combine them. So I combine them, which lead to a new hybridity term, equality of potentiality and freedom to achieve. This new term um, assumes that every individual is equally educable and the environment needs to provide necessary or desirable conditions for their further development. And in, as well as individuals' own um, commitment to their self-permission. So, the key message here I want to convey is summarized in this sentence. Equality can be maximized when the external conditions are harmonized with the individual effort, when social structure and agency are combined, collective conditions and individual are combined, the outer and inner self are combined. In this case, it's possible to have maximum personal empowerment of the maximum number. With this maximum personal empowerment of the maximum number, it points out a potential way for higher education to be organized uh, in a way that can further 
or in a more desirable way to, um, to promote social equity. And that's my talk. Um, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to all of your comments and questions. Thank you. Wow. It's complex, isn't it? And you've done a remarkable job to bring that into a small number of slides in a, in a, and in a short presentation, but clearly we'll need to unpack it to, to fully understand it. Um, you, you're combining um, the idea of Confucian self-cultivation and self-improvement, the responsibility of persons to address their own development with a sort of a March Ascent awareness of environmental conditions and the importance of providing the conditions which enable people's agency and freedom to be fully exercised and, and, and expressed. Now, underneath all of this, as you've said to us, there's the two very different traditions, you know, the Chinese uh, way of life, way of thought, scholarship over millennia, uh, the experience of government, the experience of higher education, very different to the West in many respects. And then you've got the Western Judeo-Christian, Hellenic, medieval, uh, revolutionary, uh, re Renaissance and so on, Enlightenment traditions all piling in and, and, and shaping a kind of Western view. Where, I mean, where, how different are these two worldviews? How is it possible to bring them together? And how do people who understand both cultures reconcile them in their own mind, do you think? Wow, that's an extremely difficult question. And of course, um, tremendously important for us, especially in this time of um, crisis. Um, to be honest, I'm not that uh, optimistic in terms of the conciliation of the two worldviews, because they are very different, fundamental differences. For example, the, um, the Chinese uh, uh, worldview would view the world as a harmonious whole, that um, everything is, under all, uh, is all under heaven, and um, there is no uh, absolute private space in this all under heaven. In contrast to the liberal Anglo-American worldview that um, is based mainly on the duality, that the private and the public are very different, and uh, it's important to um, emphasize the individual's independent status and their liberty. So the absolute liberty and freedom of the liberal Anglo-American traditions is kind of absolute or fundamental principle, but that's not and uh, that does not exist in the Chinese tradition where the collective good is more preferred and um, private things can be somewhat compromised for the collective good. And um, for higher education, especially when we talk about the role of the state, if we have this um, protection of liberty in the, in the liberal Anglo-American tradition, then the Chinese universities might need to be organized in a different way in relation to the relationship with, with the state. But that's not um, compatible, at least today, with the Chinese political system, at least. So um, there are a lot of uh, fundamental differences and that can hardly, can, ha can hardly be reconciled. But we can try to focus on some um, practical aspects, practical mm. aspects that can be further um, addressed by the two, by the different countries and make more um, common understanding and common efforts in that. Yeah, I mean, I take your point about the differences, but you know, it's very important to have this kind of conversation and reach this, try to reach this sort of understanding because these are two great cultures that exist in the world at the same time. And their relationship is really important. I mean, it has a lot to do with, with global harmony, global diversity and, and, and the harmonious organization of diversity uh, as to how China and the Anglo-American and West and countries relate to each other and understand each other. So what you're doing is really important. But one thing that strikes me is that scholars like yourself have come out of the Chinese higher education, engage with the West, understand Anglo-American political and educational culture pretty well, but there's not the same degree of understanding in the other direction. There's not the same engagement by Western scholars in China or curiosity about China. What do you think we can do about this? 
Wow, that's、um, an urgent thing that I would personally appear for that、um, people in English speaking. World or other language-speaking world to know, try to know more about China. But also, I think on the other hand, China needs also to open its mind to not only to the West, to the Western so-called Western world, but also other parts of the world like Africa, Latin American. So there are so many diversity in our world. We also we all need to kind of open our mind to. Uh, embrace the diversity and to have further、um, di common dialogue and conversations. But also, there is a kind of difficult、uh, in terms of language that it because most Chinese people, especially young people now, they speak English. They have access to、um, English lang English language materials, but that's not. There is not the other way around for people in the West. So probably、um, the hegemony of the language is one of the element that we might want to overcome here. Well, thanks very much again, Lily, and you've sparked a very active discussion in the chat. Many people are showering you with praise, I might say, which is very nice, and and also、uh, wanting to ask questions. So can I ask?、Um, Aki Yanazawa, our colleague at Tohoku in Japan, to ask the first question.、Uh, thank you very much.、Uh, I really congratulate the very、uh, interesting, inspiring discussion. So, the, since I am from the East Asian region,、uh, I'd like to ask that. My impression is that the, at least the Chinese,、uh, the system and the, the understanding of the, the perspective is highly.、Uh, Multi-dimensional and uh, multi-cultural、uh, means that the China China itself is not that so homogeneous, but much more diversified with, even within our sector. And、um, I also have the same impression about the so-called Anglo-American system that this is also highly multi-ethnic or multicultural system. So the、uh, could I so the I don't think it is only、uh, just a simple comparison of the two system, but much more. Highly,、uh, the the comparison of the two highly diverse system. So the、uh, could I uh, uh, ask that the, how do you、uh, insert this kind of a multi、uh, culturalism or the multi uh, ethnic or、uh, the dimension、uh, within your discussion? Thank you very much. It's a very important、um, and challenging question because this is a question I've been. Um, always asked by、um, people who who kind of who、uh, happen to know my research and examiners、um, in my、uh, upgrade or、uh, when I pre present my research. That's important because I fully recognize that the the two traditions are very highly diversified themselves, and、um, so it's not easy to kind of fully grasp all aspects of the each of the traditions. So. I have, I do not have much choice but to kind of narrow my、um, on my focus of the each tradition,、uh, at least in this stage for my doctoral thesis. So、uh, for my doctoral thesis, the liberal Anglo-American tradition, I mainly focus on the liberalism, so liberal views, not many other. For example, I mentioned the French、uh, Revolution's in, influence on the liberal Anglo-American tradition. There, it's very important, but I kind of only slightly touch on that aspect. And also for the Chinese, there are many other、um, schools of thought like Taoism and Buddhism and many other.、Um, but the other thing of kind of unique of Chinese culture is that it's highly embracing. It's、um, it's a kind of、uh, over the thousand over thousands of years development. Different schools of thought kind of converge in some to some extent. So that's、um, not. That's kind of not so difficult for the Chinese tradition to、um, to embrace a more a broader、uh, areas of so of school of thought. But I still try to focus on Confucianism with some、um, touch on Taoism and Buddhism and other schools of thought. So that's kind of how I wish to have a、um, broader grasp, but still have a clear focus because they. Inside of different traditions, they are already very different. Thank you very much. Perhaps, perhaps in future there is、um, kind of 
um, potentiality for me and for and I welcome and call for many other scholars to work on this area that we can um, bring in different perspectives into this, not only these two traditions and also other political cultures and traditions. Thank you. Okay, I mean, Thank I think you. that, you know, the discussion of culture is, has taken second place to, in higher education studies to the discussion of political economy and policy. But it's a very, very rich dimension. And of course, it interacts with the other dimensions. And I think we're all appreciating, you know, how these, these big global issues play out pretty differently from nation to nation and locality to locality, uh, diversity within nations and regional diversity. So, I mean, I think we're at the beginning stages of a very rich conversation here. I'd like to bring in uh, Peng Fei Pan, who has a question. Thanks, Lily's um, presentation. So I, got, I think I've got the similar question with uh, Akiyoshi, is that from the practical level, I think I'm quite puzzled with what you have kind of described that um, these kind of social equities we are emphasizing, but based on the fact in the, in the practice level, I'm quite, quite uh, suspicious whether it has been some institutional consensus for the higher education institutions. Because when you, when you look at the uh, Chinese education system, it's quite hierarchical. I mean, uh, compared with some Anglo-Saxon system like Australian, which is more unified. So how would you comment on that? Thank you, that's an important question. And I um, fully reckon, uh, fully echo your point of that higher Chinese higher education is very hierarchical. And I should have mentioned in my previous presentation that although there is an um, um, argue appear for social and economic equality, also there is a kind of moderate level of social and, um, polit and social and economic inequality justified by the meritocratic tradition in China since a very long time ago. So it's still now like we, it's um, in line with the Confucian idea that it's personal efforts that um, matters most. So it's kind of trying to um, minimize the, the influence of the external environment on our social equity outcomes, but trying to say that it's all determined by personal efforts and motivation. So, it, so this is, um, I, think, I think it's a um, problem that China, the Chinese um, society or Chinese tradition needs to face. And that's why I argue that we need to bring in the, the Anglo-American uh, emphasis on the external environment, that we need to provide a more equal um, environment for individuals to develop. And this is, of course, is not so uh, in line with the Chinese higher education system today. And my personal view is that um, probably this is, uh, in, is somewhat influenced by the Chinese universities' uh, pursuit for world-class status, that um, in pursuit of uh, having comprehensive research-intensive universities, the equity issue ha was somewhat um, overlooked previously, but now I notice um, there are many policies that are trying to deal with this problem. For example, the emphasis on vocational education, but the, the, <laughs> emphasis, the policies and the efforts are facing problems, um, which are also embedded in people's minds. For example, people are still prefer uh, academic routine of higher education rather than vocational routine. So there are a lot of, um, it's quite complicated and there are a lot of things um, uh, inside, inside. So it's it's a there is a gap between the theoretical discussion, conceptual discussion, and the practical um, implementation. So we, but my my thought, my wish was to have them further converge in the future. But um, just a comment on that. Well, your ob observation is that we are moving at, toward a direction that being more fair because, as my observation, is really moving a a kind of divert a direction that we are moving into as more uh, disparities between the East and the West and also these elite universities and the mass and the normal universities. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree that the, the, the pursuit for world-class university is trying, is, uh, is not um, easily easing the problem now, but mm -hmm. there are some 
uh, what I want to say here is that there are some efforts are trying to deal with this problem. <coughs> For example, the um, more investment in Western part of China higher education, but there is still a long way to go that how this pursuit of excellence can be further combined with um, pursuit of equity is a pro common problem faced by almost every country in the world, across mm -hmm. the world. And thank you. Thank you both. And I think uh, Wen Wen has a question which goes to this issue about the public or common good role of higher education. Yes. Um, hi, Lily. Thank you for your uh, uh, excellent talk. And also congratulations to your uh, completion of your PhD thesis. Um, well, um, yeah. So uh, your com uh, the, the comparison you just made between uh, uh, the relationship uh, uh, between this uh, individual state and uh, uh, the society, between these two different societies, uh, uh, set up a good foundation for us to further discuss um, university's role in today's society, uh, particularly in this uh, very difficult time. So my question is that, you know, uh, based on your uh, framework, based on your model of uh, of higher education uh, uh, traditions or what was so the, the the relationship between higher education and, and the, the society so how do you perceive the university's role in serving the society uh, in these two very different systems because i noticed that both societies i mean china and the united states uh, began to emphasize um uh, universities scholarship or this common goals to be more accessible for society and uh, we know that it's kind of tradition in, in in china for higher education to serve the state and serve the society but in the us recently we i, I noticed that there's kind of a trend to advocate to, to advocate the uh, the university's contribution to society as well. So they call it the fifth wave. And there are some, some state universities uh, uh, began to, uh, to, to promote this fifth rate to emphasize uh, the state universities. For example, the, the um, Arizona State University is, uh, is obviously a leading role in this uh, uh, movement. So they began to emphasize university's role to, to contribute to the society. And we also know that uh, in the 1970s, in 1960s, uh, in the United States, they were so, uh, you know, universities have a very good relationship to contribute, you know, with um, the society. But nowadays it seems that things are changing. Uh, so how do you perceive this this um, convergent trend in both societies to emphasize university's role, uh, you know, um, uh, to, to, to serve the society and what's, uh, is there any difference, you know, between these two societies? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the question, very important and timely. And uh, thank you for um, providing many examples of how uh, things are going in the States. Um, I think uh, from a conceptual perspective that um, the university's role or in a, co in a broader sense of the common, common good of public good idea are embedded or deeply embedded in both traditions, I have to say. The Chinese tradition, uh, we have already um, talked about that much. In the liberal Anglo-American tradition, for example, the, um, the very famous a liberal thinker, um, uh, Adam Smith. In, in his work, he already has a particular, em a particular emphasis on the contribution to the common good, to the public good, um, despite his um, argument for the uh, appear for the market. So this kind of public good idea, common good idea are embedded in both traditions. But, uh, and previously, the tr I think in the last century, universities were more committed to, the, uh, to serve the public or common good. For example, the, in the UK, um, the Robbins report were uh, an example, and as you mentioned in the States. But after that, I think it's also um, in parallel with the neoliberal wave or capitalism, the development of capitalism, that universities were kind of um, moving away from the idea of common good, also um, re relevant to, related to the cut of public funding, that they, um, there is a trend of uh, marketization in, at least in the UK and the United States, that universities are more driven towards a, a marketized uh, orientation and they need to uh, focus more on the private benefits 
of uh, students because they need to re realize the mm, financial uh, sub, uh, sustainability. So that's kind of thing that was not uh, entirely driven by our conceptual or common uh, conceptual ideas, but also the policy directions uh, of different uh, which road that which direction that different countries would like to choose. And also um, in China, I think it's um, it's it's different because there is a so deep. Um, commitment to the public good or to the collective good, even though there is a trend of marketization, still universities are, and the state, um, the government are emphasizing this, that universities need to do this. I think it's also for the sake of social order. And um, that's one of the, pro uh, one of the um, kind of, um, one of the main aspects that the government can get their, uh, can get their status and the recognition from the people. Yeah, another very full question, which could be another paper, couldn't it? Um, look, we're running out of time, but and um, I'm aware that I had Julio next on the call list. Now, Julio has asked me to ask his question for him, and his question is, which is which is the most meritocratic system, the Anglo-American system or the Ch Chinese system? Now, I want you to keep that question in mind and, and address it in the written chat section, because I want to bring in one last question in the video from Triff. Triff has missed out before, in just missed out before in being able to enter the webinar. So Triff, can you, can you possibly, are you there? Can you come in and ask your question now? Uh, thank you very much, Simon. Congratulations for uh, this uh, brilliant uh, session for Lily. How important is the ethos in this comparison? Thank you for the question. That's important aspect. And I, I think it's also the ethos is also kind of embedded in my discussion of how people uh, understand. It's a part of the culture that how people have a common understanding. It's a consensus. And also there are many, uh, for example, in the Chinese tradition, there are many uh, values like harmony, peace, um, filial piety. These, these values are commonly accepted by people and are affecting people's behaviors. And these behaviors are shaping um, the uh, shaping people's minds and shaping police policy uh, in higher education. So these are definitely important. And also in the liberal Anglo-American tradition, we have tolerance, we have human rights, we have equality and liberty. And social equity itself can be an uh, important um, values in this in this sense. So uh, I think the, the 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 ethos is kind of from the very beginning to the very end of my research. It's embedded running through the whole, uh, the whole research. Um, but I didn't kind of separately discuss it because I, I assume it's already there. Thank I you very much. Yes, thank you both. And thank you for that good question, Triff. Um, I'm afraid I'll have to bring it to a close. We could clearly go for hours, um, but, and there will be the opportunity to keep talking in the online chat. Um, it remains for me to say thank you. Thank you to Trevor, who does such a great job with our webinars. And thank you to Tom and Lily. It's such a pleasure to work with emerging scholars of this caliber. And um, I mean, the discussion today, I think has shown how good and original and important the work that both of you are doing really is. So thanks very, very much. And we look forward to having you back on the show in the future. So at this point, I will say um, goodbye and thank you to everyone who participated and look forward to seeing you again on Thursday this week when we discuss COVID-19 and global research cooperation. Bye for now.